Hi everyone, I'm back. I hope everybody is healthy and happy and that they have had a good week. Um, I hope everybody has a good Easter. Um, today I'm going to be talking about death. Um, are you terminal? Um, your friend or a family member, close family member? Um, I'm going to talk about some options, how to support um, a person who is term terminally ill. Um, also, um, the outside supports that you can get as well. And we'll go into my experiences. Um, I had a premonition about maybe less than a year um, with my grandfather. Uh, I saw in my dream, um, I had gone to see him in the nursing home and there was his bed and his winter coat at the end of the bed. And I was like, okay, so he's going to go sometime in the winter time. Uh, I usually get dreams and premonitions about people that are close to me, usually, uh, when they're going to, to pass away, and I don't say anything to anybody, usually. Uh, I don't want to get anybody upset. Um, so, I used to see my grandfather every day after supper. So, um, one day I showed up, and he wasn't outside waiting for me, because I just live around the corner. And, um, I'm like, okay, so he's either in the bathroom or he's still eating. So I went upstairs and I looked into the dining room and it was basically cleared. And then I took a trip to his bedroom and I walk in the door and there is my mother and my grandfather in bed. Um, I asked what's going on, what's wrong. And she said that he was feeling poorly. And I'm like, well, that doesn't help. Um, what do you mean by poorly? And she said, um, he's got pneumonia. And I said, okay. So um, I told her that I would come back and sit with him overnight. And that's what I did. And... Um, he never woke up the whole time I was there. Um, I just sat in his lazy boy and just watched him sleep. And, you know, he was a bit raspy and, and stuff like that. And um, the next day came along and the next day came along and I was showing up at nighttime and my mother was sitting with him during the day. So... You know, it got to the point where I was playing music for him. His favorite um, movie that we used to watch was um, The Sound of Music. And I bought him a CD for Christmas a couple of years prior for that. And he had a hard time at the end trying to figure out how to use the CD radio that we bought for him. So I had to put things on instructions on the buttons so that he would know what to push um so i would sit there and, and listen to music with him and i'd doze off uh i did find out that he was dying uh they did put him in a medically induced coma basically for pain um and he was not comfortable sometimes he would be tossing and moving around some and as soon as it was time for for needle time and the nurse would come in and and give him his shot and i would talk to them and i had never been around somebody who was passing away and my grandfather and i were very close we were like best friends so for me to see my best friend die dying it, it was hard on me and there was curiosity as well it's like well what are the stages of death? What what am I to expect? Um, a few days later, I was, you know, I'd, I walked in the one night and it was like, 
what is what it when it went what am I smelling and uh, I asked the the night nurse like what what is the smell that I'm smelling what is this and she basically said that because he hadn't drank or eaten his body is starting to shut down um, his kidneys um, his you know liver and all that so the body gives off a certain chemical reaction and I was like okay so understood I went home and I started looking at things and reading things because I was curious as to what am I going to expect and how many more days am I going to have to sit here and watch him suffer and it got to the point where I heard that everybody had come and gone and nobody else was coming so it was Halloween night and I and I was pleading with him you know you know everybody's seen you pops nobody else is coming there's no reason for you to be you know staying around you can go now I'm okay everybody else is okay it's, you can go it's your time so I went home that morning at around I guess it was like 8 or 8 30 and I got a phone call about 12 30 quarter to one in the afternoon and he had passed away so it was it wasn't a shock it was like okay all right so I got up there and I said my goodbyes to him and basically I left my mother had everything else that she needed to do they had to wait for the doctor to come and pronounce my grandfather, and that was not on me to do that, um, to stick around, and, and I was not in the plan of after his death. So it took several hours for the doctor to show up, and um, he was taken to Lakefield to be cremated, and then he was taken to Toronto, Scarborough, and he was buried about a month later with my grandmother. Um, death was his death was not easy on me. I was pretty stressed out um, afterwards. Uh, there were days where it it the the time schedule when I would see him. Um, after supper, it really got to me. It's like, I, I know I, I should be leaving. I should be getting out of here. And um, I was at a loss. I, I, time and, and, and everything, I had a lot of time with him. He was 92, 93 when he died. So I had a lot of time with him. And I appreciated everything that he did for me. He was an amazing person, an amazing man. Very, very giving, um, honest, blunt. Um, so his death was, yeah, it was hard on me. It was hard for me to drive by the nursing home. Um, I would get sad every time I had to go by it. Dinner time would roll around. I would get, you know, lonely. And I was like that for quite a few months. Um... And then with my dad, um, my dad's story was um, just before Father's Day, I found out that my dad had um, cancer of the liver and his options were very narrow. Um, he did not qualify for chemotherapy because he, uh, his heart and stamina were just not up to par. He was um, a longtime smoker. He did not exercise. Uh, I think he was about 220 um, when he was diagnosed and he was in a lot of pain. But they did put a pick in him before they found out that he was not qualified for chemo. And after about three months, he said, I want this thing out of me because they had it up, up here. A pick is something that they would put the chemotherapy medication in and pain relief. So my dad got fed up and said, hey, I want this removed. A couple months later, he went in and he did um, radiation treatment. 
and he dropped a lot of weight. He was very sick. Um, he could hardly keep things down. Uh, it was not a very good experience for him. And in that time, um, he was told that uh, he would have about three years to live. And that, that's very hard to deal with. Um, my dad was only 66. So, yes, yeah, 66 when he found out that he had liver cancer. And I felt like, yes, I did have enough time with my dad. Um, but some days I just wish that we had had more. Um, in the summer of 2020, uh, my dad had his big toe removed, I think a few months before that, and, um, it was taking forever to heal. He was uncomfortable. The nurses were coming in and changing his bandages every day or every other day. And then his second toe next to it was getting bad. And so they they wanted to take it, take it off as well. But he had to go to a specialist, the specialist first, a diabetic specialist or somebody up here in Peterborough to take a look at it. And he came to my place after seeing this doctor. And I took one look at my dad. I think it had been maybe a month prior to me seeing him, that I saw him last. And he walked in my door, and he, he's, like, I gave him a hug and kiss, and he sat down, and I took one look at him, and I'm like, where were you guys coming from? And she, my stepmom said, uh, uh, an appointment about getting his, his second toe removed. And I just gave her, like, are you serious? A serious look and um, I tried not to get upset because the way my dad looked was he's his liver is failing he's in end-stage liver failure he was yellow his fingernails were yellow and uh, he went and used the bathroom and I said to my stepmom I said are you ready for me to come down and help and she she said yes I said well you know, let me know and then give me a couple of days to get things straightened out here and then I'll come down and help you. My dad's wishes were, um, I don't want to go in the hospital and die. I want to die with dignity. I want to die at home. Um, so that was his wishes and we were going to make it work as much as we could. So the first night that I was down there, it was pretty hard. Um, I had my stepmom go to sleep and I was up with my dad. He decided that he was going to go to sleep. So he went to his bedroom and I was sitting up because I'm good at doing midnight. So I was sitting up and I heard the brakes on the, uh, the walker go. And I'm like, Oh, for Pete's sakes, I told him to, you know, ask for help because at that time between the time that I came down um, my stepmom had um, called the doctor my dad had talked to the doctor and he had sent a nurse over to help um, put in an IV line and so that my dad all my dad had to do was press a button for pain relief and something for anxiety as well and it, it's monitored and you can't cheat it. It's all, you know, if, if he goes through all the medication, then then that's that's fine. But he can only get it every so many hours or so many minutes. So he doesn't overdose. So um, I run to the bedroom and I'm like, I told you, you got to call me um, to come and help you. And I, you know, he had to go to the bathroom and he went to the bathroom and then he come back out and have a cigarette and then he'd go back to bed. And then 15 minutes later, he was back up and, you know, have to go to the bathroom again. And I'm like, okay. So it, it was 
you know, he was up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'm like, Daddy, you need your rest. You need to sleep. And uh, he he wasn't, it's not like he wasn't listening to me. It's like when you're in liver failure and, and, and your body's starting to shut down, you're not really mentally, you know, understanding of people and things like that it's almost like you're in the moment in the moment in the moment and you know thoughts are going in and going out and you know so it was hard to you know explain things to him and stuff like that and we went through this with him for two nights and the two of us weren't getting any sleep because every time he was getting up to go to the bathroom he was waking my stepmom up she was jolting her basically she was in the other room next door but you know, she could hear everything. She's got really good ears. And so she talked to the doctor. And, um, you know, there was other options that we could explore. So my stepmom went to a new place that was built in Colberg, um, a new hospice place. So she went and checked it out. And um, they could take him that night. So she sat dad down and said, look, um, you're having a hard time. You know, you're not sleeping. Um, my birthday's coming up. How about we go away for a little vacation? And my dad said, oh, okay. And she's like, well, it's got a big TV. You've got, we've got your own room. There's a fridge. People can cook for us. You have your own bathroom. You have nursing staff right there. My dad was like, okay, sure. So we got a transport system and the ambulance came and picked him up, brought him there, and she stayed with him overnight. And um, everything turned out great. I mean, dad was there for, I think, less than a week. Um, mom would do days, I would do evenings, the nurses were there, and, you know, my dad was still adamant at getting up and using the commode. Actually, he wanted to use the bathroom, but we're like, no, you can't walk. You know, here's the commode, you know, but my dad was a proud man, and he didn't want anybody helping him, and he felt really strong about, you know, he's going to get out of bed and he's going to do this, and he couldn't do it by himself. And it got crazy because he was so skinny and thin. I think he was bent down to about 150 pounds when he uh, was in end stage. And he actually could squeeze in between the bottom rail and the top rail of the medical bed. He squeezed right in between there to go to the bathroom. I, I was just beside myself. I couldn't leap so quickly out of the, the bed that they had there for me um, to get to him, to make sure that he didn't fall and hurt himself. It was crazy. So he was getting up and down and up and down and up and down. And it was great. He wasn't getting any sleep. His legs were in so much pain. He was in pain. Um... So we had a, a catheter put in. He actually agreed to it. If if he understood or not, I don't think he understood. Um, they did put it in. He was not comfortable with doing it, but he had it done. And then they were able to give him medicine. Um, he was able to just relax and do whatever he wanted when he was awake and he didn't have to get up and keep on using the bathroom. Um, I, I would talk to him. Um, I told him everything I was going to miss. And um, we watched a couple of movies, um, listened to music. He slept a lot. Um, in the last two, three days... Um, he was in a, in a coma basically. And, um, so it was, it was hard for me. Uh, I didn't want to leave him alone. And what was great when I went, stepped outside that a nurse would be sitting with him, 
not a problem. Go, go. You know, you need some time out. Go ahead. I'll sit with him. Yeah, sure. I'm like, okay. Um, any questions I had, they answered them. You know, they I would ask me if I was hungry. There was food available. You know, they were amazing people. Amazing people. Um, the night my dad died, we, uh, I sat there and held his hand and we listened to all his favorite music. And, um, I told my dad, you know, dad, nobody else is coming. Just like grandpa. And, uh, it's time for you to go. Um, everybody's been here, so you don't need to be here anymore. You don't need to linger anymore. You know, it's better on the other side now. It's ready for you. You're, you can go. And about a couple hours later, my dad started long-term breathing. The pauses between breathing were getting really long. And, uh, I called my stepmom. I said, you know, you should, you should come. He's, he's almost, he's almost gone. He's, he's slipping away. And not even two minutes after I got off the phone with her, my dad was gone. He knew. He heard the last thing for a person when they're dying is their brain activity. They hear everything. And my dad did not want my stepmom there to see him go. He did not want her last minutes with him like that. She spent the afternoon with us. I was there with my dad as well. I, you know, I gave him a, like a spa day. I shaved off the beard and made him look pretty and did his nails and everything. And, you know, he just laid there and I was like, he's like a really good patient this time around. <laughs> and, uh, he's just, he was peaceful. And when my dad went, um, I ran right around his bed and I cranked open the window and I told my dad to fly. Don't stay here. You know, set your soul free. Don't stay here. Go. And a few minutes later, the, you know, the nurse did close the window. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure dad's gone now. But um, it was almost like um, a relief. It was a feeling of, <sighs> he's gone. Is no more pain. And it, it was elation. Because his journey felt like it was so long for him. And in the long, the months prior to that, he, I think he felt it too. Because I would see him almost every two weeks, it seemed. Or every month, like, I was surprised visit. You know, let's go and see Sandy. You know, let's go have a visit. He had the need to come and see me. And I'm so grateful for that. It was almost exactly a year between my grandfather and my dad. My grandfather died November 1st, 2019, and my dad went November 3rd, 2020. It was hard. It was very hard. And I can still cry over it. As my dad was everything to me. And I kind of feel cheated. I felt like I didn't have enough. Enough of him. But I am glad with the time that I did have.
Death is not easy for people. I understand. Some people just don't show it. Some people do. Talking about it helps. Um, talking about it with friends and family, it helps. Um, if you can't, there's always, always somebody to talk to. There's therapists, there's doctors. If, if it's taking you a long time to get over somebody's death, there are bereavement groups that you can join. Um, ask your doctor. Ask pound 988. Talk to them. They're there 24-7. If you're still struggling and if you feel like you need to talk to somebody, So I'm going to take a quick break, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Um, this video might be cut short. Um, if it does, I will put in a part two, just in case. Okay, so as I talked about my dad, he had his wishes. And one of his wishes that he stipulated was that he didn't want a funeral. He didn't want a burial. Um, we, he wanted to be his ashes dumped in a place in Coburg. And um, basically, if we wanted to have a party, we could have a party afterwards if we wanted to. He didn't care. He was a very simple man. He didn't want to put any financial burden on anyone. <clears throat> so, if you are clueless and you don't know what to do um, when it comes to yourself, or if your family member or friend does not have any will um, plans, it's best to break the ice and have a talk. You want to know what they want done, like if they're terminal, um, if they become terminal or something happens, what do you, what do you, what, what do they want? What do you want? <clears throat> um, I wrote notes again. Okay. So you have to have some open talks with um, the person who is going to die. Um there are options. There are full burial where they do not cremate. There are cremation. Um, you can also donate your body to science. Um, and then there's, you know, what do you want? Where do you want to be in your last days? Do you want to be at home? Do you want to be in palliative care? Do you want to be in hospice care? Do you want a death doula? Um, you want to know, you know, do you want a funeral? Do you want a party? Do you want a wake? Um, what do you want done with your remains? Do you want them scattered instead? <clears throat> do you want somebody to hold on to them? Do you want um, jewelry made out of your ashes? Um, do you want everybody to have a separate urn? You know, there's a lot of things to talk about. And it's, and it's one thing that, you know, to speak it, but you should also write out what you want or what they want so that their wishes and your wishes are accepted and followed by. Um... I wrote down definitions. We know what home care would be like, but there's some things to go with home care. Okay, so what is palliative care? Okay, pa palliative care, it is special it specializes care for a person's needs for pain relief and other serious illnesses along with treatment to cure their ser serious illness. There are short stays to manage symptoms or last months, weeks, days of life. 
that's usually in a hospital that palliative care is given. Hospice care, um, the one that I went to, my dad went to, was free, free of charge. You now they raise money, raise funds, and I believe the government gives them some money as well. I'm not quite too sure. So this is what a hospice is. It's basically free in Canada, in the U.S., I'm not sure. Don't quote me on it. You're going to have to do your research. It's a place to stay in the end of life for support care, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, as well as family and friend support. Amazing places, I'm telling you. These people that run these hospice, hospice cares, amazing people. Amazing. They're, they're angels, walking angels. A death doula. They help restore sacredness to the person that is dying. They provide respite care, respite care to exhausted caregivers, wife, husband, partner, children. They bring a deep meaning to the dying experience and prepare people for the last breaths of their loved ones. End of Life Doula Association of Canada for more for more information. Okay, so you can talk to your doctors or their doctors or they can talk to their doctors for um for extra help too. So if you were to stay at home, they would set up a nurse for pain relief, they would come in and put a pick in. Um any other things that you need um if this is the beginning of a journey, you may want um, to know if there's any help out in the community that you can you you can get rides to cancer treatments. Um, in my community, we have community care. It's around the region, so they um, they will pick you up and charge you only a certain amount, and will take you to appointments. Sometimes they'll take you out to do grocery shopping as well. And they will sit there or they will come in with you and help you. Um, they're, they're amazing. They're, they also um, can, they rent out equipment. So hospital beds. We had a hospital bed for my dad and a table from community care. They came, they set it up, and they left. Um, walkers, commodes as well. They had a commode, I believe, for my dad as well. So, I mean... This you got to look at community resources. Ask your doctor what are what are the options, what are what is available to me, in my time of need or my loved one. Um, they also will come and disassemble everything and take it all away after you have passed away or your friend or loved one. Vaughn, a Victoria Order of Nurses is what we have in Canada. They are amazing people, and I believe the Red Cross. Not sure about them, but um, Vaughn will come in, and they will check up on you or your friend or family member, um, write down notes for the next uh, nurse that comes in. Um, you know, they will bath you. Um, they will do a lot of things. They are a great resource to have by your side. And if you have any questions, ask them. They're a book, a knowledge book. Um, another thing is, who do you want to pick you up after you have passed away? Um, there are some cremation places that will pick you up um, after you've been pronounced uh, and bring you to their... their um, their place of business and will have you cremated. Um, some funeral homes will pick you up as well. Uh, so you can shop around and call around and see what services are available in that manner um, before you pass away or your friend or family member. You can also ask to see a priest for your last rites or a minister, you know, to sit and have prayers with you. 
Um, animals, if you have any pets, you can also let people know what you want with your, your pets, what and time with your pets, who would take them after you pass away. Um, it's a good idea to have these things talked about. Um, a lot of people don't. Um, the majority do, but some people just don't. Um, so animals are placed into um, shelters and rescues after their owners have passed away. So it's a good idea to have a plan, an action plan for them, um, for them to have a new home. Um, somebody that they're familiar with too, that they, you regularly come, that regular, regularly comes in your home. Um, that would be a really good option. If you don't have a will, it's a good idea to do one. If you're lacking in the money and the funds, so be it. It's a good idea to write things down, sit down with the people that are going to inherit your money or um, materialistic things um, and go from there. Um, I think that me personally, if I don't have a will right now, I would um, sit down and write down everything that I have, take pictures and write on the backs on who I want, where to go. I have a lot of collectible things. So, um, you know, I would write down, okay, so, so-and-so gets this item with a picture so that they know what it is. Um, so that, you know, there's no fighting, arguing or bickering. Um, or what, um, you could do is start distributing out, the items that you want certain friends and family members to have. After a person dies, things get tied up. It could take a couple of years, could take a couple of months. It's crazy, I know. But sometimes it's easier just to start giving um, a living gift, gifts out to people that you want to have certain items to. So that you know that they are going to get it and that there's not going to be a war or a war over anything. Um, bills. If you or your loved one or your friend is passing away and your name is not on the bill, then you are not obligated to pay that. If you are on a credit card or a loan, yes, with that person. Other than that, you do not have to pay their bills. Now, mind you, if, there is, if they are renting an apartment, you might have to um, seek money quickly for an, an extra month of rent so that you can clear out their apartment and their items immediately um, if you need the time to, to go through everything. So an extra month of rent would really go a long way. Um, some people pay last month's rent, so it could go towards that, which is good, a good thing. But some people just pay month to month, so you might want to find out what the options are. Um, sometimes the government will pay for somebody to be cremated. Uh, a lot of questions um, you can you can have answered is by calling um, fu uh, funeral homes and or cremation places. Um, also, you can call your local government and find out what what is covered and what's not covered. Um, the cremation place that we used for my dad, um, they were so gracious enough to um, apply for a funeral expense for my dad. Um, for my dad to be cremated. Um, no, that's wrong. No, my stepmom paid up front um, for my dad to be cremated. Um, they applied for widow's pension for my mom, my stepmom, and something else. But they, they, they did. Like, we had to hand over my dad's birth certificate, I believe, and my dad's health card, and they did the rest. 
they did all the paperwork so my stepmom didn't have to have to go through all that. How to be of support for a person who is terminal and in their last days. Um, making visits as often as you can for them, for you, for your peace of mind. Making visits for friends and families, uh, family members as open as you can. So they can come and go being open to that for them it would be a, a, a really good thing a lot of people don't have um, time to take off work so coming after work coming after supper um, coming before they go to work um, so that they get to spend time with your loved one or yourself you can play music music is the greatest thing and they and as I said the brain is the last thing for them for, for a dying person to go. So they hear everything and it soothes the soul and it's a great send off. Music is, is the most wonderful thing that has ever come to us on this earth. You can sit and um, watch movies together if they're awake. Um, you can talk, um, tell them how much you're gonna miss them, how much you love them. Um, you can play games, card games, board games, um, go for walks if, if they're able to. You can take them out for a walk and um, get some fresh air, just sit, sitting outside and just enjoying the day. If they're in a medically induced coma, that's something that you, of course, can't do. Um, just holding their hand and being silent even does... The world of best because they know that you're there and they're going through the end stages they're just I find that some people just linger on and they want to make sure that everybody sees them before they say adios I'm gone I'm out of here I'm going to the next stage on the other side so that's it for me tonight guys I'm sorry I had a, a cry spell but my dad meant a lot to me, and um, he's with me right now. I did deposit some of my dad where he wanted, but I do have dad here, and I put dad in a couple of other spaces too. And he is in a necklace as well for my stepmom, but my stepmom wanted dad with me, so dad has his own shelf. He has a picture. He has a few things on his shelf. So that I can just walk up and say, hey, dad. And my stepmom comes and she looks at his shelf and his picture and says hello as well. You know, some people don't need to be buried. They don't want to be buried. It's a waste of money. You know, some people just want to be tossed out the car window. So it's all a matter of opinion and how you want to deal with your own death or how your friends and family want to deal with their own deaths. And it shouldn't be a taboo thing. We're in the day and age where we're, we see death on TV, movies. Why not talk about it? Why not make an open conversation? My dad for years expressed what he wanted done and was adamant. This is what's to be done. I want this done. And if you don't do it, I'll come back and haunt you. So listening, writing down, getting a will, talking with your friends and family about what you want is the most important and how you want to exit this world. So I'll leave you with that. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment. If you're not subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button. Ring the notification bell. And I'll see you guys on the next video. Happy Easter. Blessings. Bye, everyone. Thanks.